Well, it's great to be with you this morning and um, very much looking forward to this series. We have three weeks, lots of Bible that we could talk about, so we won't get to it all, but I hope to um, take some very prime and central examples and cover those and also kind of talk about how we can do this kind of analysis. And um, so I'm going to begin with a screen share here. I have some slides to share with you. I'm gonna get here. Okay, how's that look? Are you seeing my slides slide there? Great. And um, I like to look at the slide and the person talking or the whole group myself. So if you, there should be an option for you to select um, either a, a way to either have the gallery view um, with the slide with the gallery or the slide with the picture. And you may be able to do that in the upper right hand corner of your screen if you, if that makes a difference to you. So, um, here we go with the clobber passages. First, I just wanted to start a conversation with you all on what do you see? What do you hear? What comes to your mind? Why did you come to this class? What are some clobber passages that you think of? And if you could just type them into the chat box, this will um, help get us started, I think. So I'm gonna open my chat box too, so I can look at that. And you may not, I'm not asking you for the biblical citation, just like what are the words that you've heard used against you or against other people? Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, good one. Yep, we probably will talk about that one on the third week, but the Bible says, right, that's a very general one. Adam and Eve in the garden blaming women, yep, mm -hmm. women subject to men, be obedient, be silent in church. No one can come to the Father but through me. Yep, that's been used against people of other faiths or no faiths. Um, someone with an agenda trying to get, get us, you, me, to behave in a certain way. That scripture about Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No one gets life, life. No one gets to the Father but through me. And slavery in the Bible, yes. Yep, women be silent in church. These are all the ones that I was thinking of. The curse of Ham, yeah. We're definitely gonna talk about that one and get into that. That was Noah um, cursing his son Ham and Ham's descendant and how people added interpretation to that over time. The poor will always be with us. That's good, I had not thought about that one. Uh, we, we might pick that one up at some point. Well, great. If you think of other ones, um, you can add them into that um, chat box at any point, because I'm going to save the chat. So there are some clobber passages. So I want to talk about this idea of the Bible being a weapon. First, just the obvious point that any tool can become a weapon, a coffee cup could be used to kill someone. And sometimes really wonderful tools are turned into weapons. Um, and, you know, another idea that comes to my mind about that is sexuality is a very good gift from God that's given to us as a way to connect with other human beings, to express love, and yet it's been used as a weapon in war or in other situations where sexuality gets turned into a way to harm someone. So um, coffee cups, sexuality, uh, the Bible, which is such a important source of inspiration for us and a tool of our faith, gets turned into a weapon. So we identified some themes in the scriptures that we just listed out. And some of the things the Bible has been used as a weapon to justify racism, slavery, and segregation. We're gonna take a deep hard look into some of those uses of the Bible. Um, sexism, women, be obedient, be silent. Heterosexism, homophobia. Um, that being gay is a sin. We're gonna definitely look at a bunch of the texts that are used about that. 
um, the domination of other faiths. So the whole, no one gets to the father except through me. Christianity is the one way, the best way, the only way. Um, that's been kind of used as a weapon against some people. Anti-Semitism in particular, um, and this is an especially tricky one because our New Testament records a time when the early Jewish followers of the Jewish Jesus were breaking away from other Jews who were not seeing Jesus as Messiah. And so we have texts in our scripture about the Jews, the Jews. And throughout history, that has been used to um, foster violence and pogroms and um, obliterating whole communities of Jewish people. So um, that's another one. And, and maybe there are other isms I'm sure that come to mind. Um, you'll always have the poor with you, for example. If any other ones come to your mind, do go ahead and put them in the chat box. So again, the Bible is a tool of inspiration. It actually has real good news about Jesus Christ and God's love and having a vision of a diverse, abundant, beautiful world living in peace and justice. So in that way, the Bible is a tool of inspiration and not a weapon of domination. It could just be a tool, but unfortunately it's also a weapon. And sometimes the same texts can be used um, about this. You can take one text and see that beautiful creation of God. You can take it and use it as a weapon against another person. So for today, I'm trying to make some um, big, big ideas and big sweeps. We will take a look at one scripture um, a little bit deeper towards the end of our time together. My tool today is this book, Jesus, the Bible and Homosexuality, Explode the Myths, Heal the Church. This book is from 2009. It's written by Jack Rogers, who used to be a moderator of our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. And in the book, what he has done is he, uh, he recounts his change from thinking that being gay is a sin and gay people are sinful and God is judging them and against them into being accepting of them. But he does a deep dive into the Bible to figure out how the church uses the Bible on all of these controversial issues um, that are very significant social issues that we've already named, slavery, segregation, women's roles, um, gay identity. And so he does this deep study and he identifies some patterns of misusing the Bible to justify oppression. So he sees something similar being done in all of these cases. And here's a quote from his book. He said, on each of these issues, at one point, the church had near unanimity of opinion and then over time and painfully changed its mind to almost the exact opposite view. So what can we learn from how the church dealt with these issues in the past? And he talks about the pattern. What was the pattern? In each case, he said, we accepted a pervasive societal prejudice and then we read that back into the scripture. We took certain scriptures out of context and claimed to read them literally with tragic consequences for those to whom these verses were applied. So he challenges the idea that we're reading them literally when we're using them in these um, weaponized ways. So here's the pattern he identified. Leaders in the church, preachers, other leaders in the church, the people at general assemblies who were voting on policies, leaders broadly in the church claimed three things about each group of people that suffered, and I would say suffers oppression. And this is the first thing. The pattern is the leaders would say the Bible records God's judgment against the sin of people of African descent from their very first mention in scripture. The Bible records God's judgment against women from the very first mention in the scripture. The Bible records God's judgment against 
the sin of homosexuality from their very first mention in scripture. This pattern, this argument was made in each of these cases. Number two, leaders in the church claimed that people of African descent are somehow inferior in moral character and incapable of rising to the level of full white, in that case, full white Christian civilization. Women, inferior in moral character and capable of rising to the level of full male Christian civilization. LGBTQ persons, same thing, incapable of rising to the level of full heterosexual Christian civilization. And then the third point that was made, people of African descent are willfully sinful, often sexually promiscuous and threatening and deserve punishment for their own acts. Women, willfully sinful, sexually promiscuous, threatening, deserving punishment. LGBT persons, same argument. So I wanna take a look at these three arguments and think about how do we see these claims played out today? The Bible showing a judgment against this group of people, this group being morally inferior, this group being willfully sinful, promiscuous, and threatening. So I just want to pause here and kind of talk about that, get your reactions to this idea that there's this pattern. Do you see the pattern? Do you see it playing out in our society today? And I know it will take a moment for everybody to switch gears from being listeners into being talkers. You could also chat in the chat box if that helps. Um, well, I have heard a lot of people say oh. that they don't like the Bible because of its stance on slavery. Yeah. But if that's like an uneducated um, guess of what the Bible says about slavery because the slavery that's in in the Old Testament was nothing like the slavery that's been in the world for the past thousand years, completely different. So I think people need to be educated about slavery in the old days from the Bible because it's just, it's, it's different. That's a great point, Laura. And we will get into that a little more deeply. Um, yeah, there were different kinds of slavery throughout history, indentured servitude, the chattel slavery in the United States and in the um, transatlantic trade was a different kind of ownership of human beings saying that people were actually property of other people and not human beings or not full human beings. So there are differences in the kinds of slavery, but we have to struggle with the existence of slavery in general. And, and um, we will look more deep, deeply into that. What do we do when the Bible seems to be affirming something that we don't think is okay in this day and age? We have to look back into that cultural context. Um, and what happened at that time doesn't mean that that's good or okay to happen in this time. And that's another thing. How do we use the Bible? Yeah. Annette? Great point. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, I think uh, that, you know, the things that I've read in the past um, say that as the United States became uh, active in chattel slavery and bringing people over, um, you know, they use the Bible. Many of the early Americans were Puritans and pilgrims and, and people who studied the Bible, theologians, if you will. And they use the Bible to justify uh, the act of slavery by dehumanizing um, the Africans mm -hmm. and making them appear savage, uh, needing to be uh, kept and needing to be instructed and needed to be disciplined and so on and so forth. And they use the Bible to underscore that. And, you know, the early uh, universities like Harvard, which were religious universities originally uh, helped to promote those ideas. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that, that was a really right. good example. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm gonna read some horrendous quotes of what Presbyterian preachers were saying back in the day. They were saying that, um, you know, abolition was 
wicked and perverse and destructive of all society and was the moment of the life or death of the church we should decide to say that slavery was evil and wrong it would destroy the church there were people preaching that so laura while you say the bible doesn't support slavery preachers were saying it did um very prominent preachers were very vigorously saying that at times in history yeah i see you debbie and then colleen yeah, I, I always like the first couple of verses of the uh, Gospel of John, but a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with a fundamentalist that really took me aback. And I, I said to this person who happened to be a white man that I thought that the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus's teachings in the New Testament were, were the, the real crux, the kernel of Christianity. And he came right back at me and he said, well, those first verses of John in the beginning was the word and word was God. That means that all those things in the Old Testament was Jesus talking to. And in other words, those things like overpower everything Jesus said in the New Testament. And I was really clobbered by that. So I'm yes. glad we're talking about those clobber passages because yes. we really need some comebacks. to. Come yes, to yes. That. That's good. We have to add that to the list. Somebody type that in the chat box. So I have it. Um, and, and that's about like Christians replacing Jews. Um, so supersessionism is the theological term that uh, Jews messed it up. So now Christians are on top or they're the best. Um, and we can take a look at that. And, and it's some scriptures, for example, that say the promises of God are irrevocable and that affirm God's ongoing relationship with the Jewish people in covenant now still. Um, Christians have not replaced Jews. But yeah, how are the biblical texts used on that? Colleen, I called on you. I was thinking of a couple of things. First of all, regarding women, um, if you think about the Catholic Church, the role of women in the Catholic Church is limited. Um, and also in the Mormon Church, um, they say that women are equal, but they're not because they are separate. So the, this discrimination against women it, it still goes on. And I was also thinking about the LGBTQ community. Uh, if we're looking to see if this still goes on today in the church, You've told us that there are denominations who do not accept the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Yes, most definitely. The idea of sexual promiscuity, um, the idea that black people are violent or you know, inherently deserve whatever bad treatment they get from the police, including death. I mean, these themes are still in our society. Uh, other thoughts on this? Okay. Uh, well, we are going to be deeply diving into a number of those and picking up a few of those texts. Um, so next week, for example, we're definitely going to go a deep dive into the curse of Ham and how that was used in racist ways to justify slavery and then segregation and to fight against um, Black people getting the vote, um, let alone getting free. Um, we will talk about Adam and Eve and the blaming of women from the beginning of the Bible and then how Paul handles that and women's roles. And that is still an issue in many other Christian denominations where women are not welcomed into leadership, including some Presbyterian ones. We have some churches, some Presbyterian Church of America churches in Chicago that don't ordain women. Um, we are Presbyterian Church USA and Presbyterian Church of America split from us when we started ordaining women. Um, so that, that's still an issue in many other denominations as well. And the third week, I really want to spend some time focusing on the text used against the gay community. Um, there are about seven texts and that will be the last class and next month is Pride. So I'm definitely going to hit these top three isms and oppressions and, and look at some specific Bible verses about them. But I'm also hearing other stuff about Christian exclusivism and, exclusivism and Christian superiority. So I'll, 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 I might be able to throw something in about that. 
um, I will invite you to vote in the chat box. If there's, if you have something that you feel like you need help with in particular, and I will interpret what you've already typed in there as kind of um, things that you'd like to understand better. But if you want to like give an extra vote to something, go ahead and type that in the chat box. So I've said I want to talk about the Bible as a tool of inspiration rather than a weapon of domination, even using the same texts. So one of the things I want to do is get into the Tower of Babel, actually. Um, the Tower of Babel, what does it say and what does it teach? So first, I want to just talk with you about it and have you think about what do you remember about the Tower of Babel? Let's try to tell each other the story. What does it say and what is it teaching? What happens in the story? Anybody? Yeah, they were building a, a tower to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were, you know, building it higher and higher and higher. And then the Holy Spirit descends and uh makes them speak different languages so that they couldn't continue and they had to discontinue building this uh this tower because they couldn't understand each other yes yes how about other things anybody else remember what was the sin of the people what was wrong with what they were doing according to what you recall pride pride yes that is the common teaching. They were prideful and they were trying to build their towers so high that they would they were trying to become like God or be as tall, as big as God. Any other details that you remember about this story? That is basically the way the way we've been taught to remember and think about the Tower of Babel for sure. Um, so um, pride, arrogance, self-aggrandizement, um, trying to be like God. And this diversity is kind of punishment. And God confuses the languages and scatters the people. And it's uh, taught as a kind of punishment. Now let's take a look at what the Bible actually says. So this is Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar, Shinar, and settled there. The whole earth had one language and the same words. And they said to one, one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So if we look at this, look, we look for patterns. This is the narrator describing the beginning of the story. It's almost like, setting the scene what's at issue here the whole earth had one language and the same words so all the people another translation says all the people on earth had one language and the same words the word people is not in there in the hebrew it just says all had one language and the same words and so they say they're going to build this city and, and the tower is going to have its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad. So they don't want to be scattered. They want to stay together. And they want to make a name for themselves. But what could it mean to make a name for themselves? Let's stop and think about that for a minute. What does it mean to make a name for themselves? Anybody who hasn't spoken have an idea? Uh, Kathy, yeah. Just, I don't know what it means, but I'm wondering if money is involved. Money. Why, money. Do, you wonder, why do you wonder that? Just say a few more words about that. Because it just seems like money is always involved. And if they're famous and, um, you know, they're, 
Okay. You know, it, 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 yeah. I don't know. It just sounds, sounds like money to me. <laughs> well, no, I heard something in what you said. You said, if they're famous. So you're thinking making a name for yourself is getting famous, getting well-known. That's making a name. And that is how we think about it contemporarily. Uh, Joanne. Yes. Another thing I think of is if you make a name for yourself, then everyone else is not that name. It's kind of like an identification of we are this and they aren't. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's creating an identity. That's another way of thinking about it. Very true. Colleen and then Jeannie. Uh, and making a name for yourself to me implies that you do something, you accomplish something um, that makes your name worthy of being known. Mm. You accomplish something. Yes. You develop a worthiness. Yeah. Worthy of being known. Mm -hmm. So connected. It's kind of like both. It's, it's creating an identity, but that has this value of becoming known, which is Kathy's thought. It's like Joanne and Kathy's thing together. Good. Jeannie. And then I'll go back up to Sherry. To me, there's a sense of exclusivity. Uh, meaning separate and apart and somehow more special, kind of like a country club. So those are those who can get in and, and those who cannot, and somehow we're better because we're, we're part of this exclusive mm. club. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Sherry. Yeah, to me, it implies power over some other group. Hmm. So making a name implies power. Can you say a few more words about that? More like what Jeannie was just saying, more exclusive. So you're exclusive. So you have some power over people that aren't in your group. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, Ken. Yeah. You know, I think of it as um, underscoring that arrogance uh, that says uh, perhaps I think really highly of myself. And now I want you to know my name. Mm. And so I'm going to make a name for myself that will uh, match the greatness of us. So it's mm. almost an, an arrogance. Yes, yes, yeah. So that, uh, Colleen, yeah. One and last Sam. Um, now they were building a tower to make a name for themselves. Today we do things like um, movie stars make a wonderful movie and that makes a name for themselves. And mass shooters make a name for themselves. So it can be something good that you accomplish or something horrible. Mm -hmm. Right, something that's, that, that captures the attention and you become well known. Sam, what were you thinking? I was thinking that uh, I was re reflecting on uh, the ancient Greek culture was very big on making a name for oneself and that implied immortality. Uh, for instance, in Homer's uh, Iliad, Achilles had a choice of living a long, happy life or dying early and having his name known. And Achilles said, I want to have my name known, therefore I will be immortal. So there's some immortality to having your name known. Yeah, that's great. Very interesting. Um, Ted. Yeah, I'd like to build on uh, Ken's comment. Um, about the arrogance, you know, I think there's another arrogance sort of blended in here, and that is the notion that the writers at the time even knew what the whole earth was. <laughs> you know, this this was when Genesis was written. You could argue that uh, people had no clue what the entire earth was, and <laughs> um, uh, they didn't know about lots of other civilizations and so on. So, I think it's sort of a double arrogance: one that it's the whole earth, and then exactly what Ken said. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. It's good then to think about the context of this small people, group of people, um, creating a teaching story that applies to their people. Um, yeah, very interesting. Good. Um, well, this arrogance idea was definitely picked up early by some of the commentators, and that's how we get this interpretation of the story that it's about pride and arrogance primarily. Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of that comes from that statement, they built a name for themselves. Um, but, it's, but other early commentators, a few of the rabbis talked more about making a name in the sense that Joanne first brought up to create an identity. 
and that we're going to create an identity with one language in this one city and we're going to have one tower that's big enough to hold all of us in it and that that was the problem. Um, that interpretation did not really win out and get power um, as much as the argument, the interpretation about arrogance. So let's keep going in the story. Um, uh, well, I'll just add, you know, I reminded by seeing that I bolded scattered abroad, the whole idea that what they were afraid of was not being unknown, but being scattered. So there's this desire to stay together in with their one language in their one city. So then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built and the Lord said, look, they are one people and they have all one language. It is interesting that that get, keeps getting repeated. This is the this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So the more common interpretation looks at this capacity question, ties it with the idea of arrogance and being um, going all the way up to heaven. And so they interpret this as saying that the people are gaining too much power and they're going to be too much like God, that, that that's the concern that God has here. The Common English Bible is a very trusted uh, translation that I go to a lot. It's a more contemporary translation, but done by scholars who went back to the original languages, the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament, primarily. Um, and they translate this section as, this is what they have begun to do compared to in the NRSV, this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible, focused on capacity. But in the Common English Bible, this is what they have begun to do. Make themselves one people with only one language. This is what they've begun to do. And now all that they plan to do will be possible for them. And so we ask ourselves the question, what have they proposed? What do they plan to do? And um, that's where I go back to that. They plan to be one people with one language. So God goes on to say, come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. And this word confuse, this is in the New Revised Standard Version. Those, that's what our pew Bibles are. And the Hebrew word is balal which means to mingle or to confuse or to mix. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. They were no longer there, they were scattered. Therefore it was called Babel because there the Lord balaled the language of all the earth, Babel, balal. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So I wanted to think about this balal. The, the common English Bible doesn't say confuse. It picks that interpretation to mix. The Lord mixed up the language of all the earth, mixed them, and from there scattered them. So um, I'm raising the question, what if the sin in this text is not pride? What if the sin is isolationism and clinging to the familiar? What if the sin is a failure to fill the earth, to go and fill it and populate it in abundance and diversity? What if God sees that happening and says the people, this is what the people have begun to do, to be one people in one place with one language. And if we let them keep doing that, they're going to be able to do it. So God intervenes and scatters them and mixes the languages. So in that interpretation, the Tower of Babel presents diversity as a gift, not as a punishment. God, it doesn't anywhere say that God is punishing them. God is just stopping them from doing what they said they were going to do. And we put the punishment on it. And God is scattering, and this scattering is a kind of filling the abundant earth, scattering seeds. 
So contemporary interpreters are bringing this old interpretation from some of the rabbis up and trying to give it more uh, visibility. And we have a, a foot a note here in the chat from Penn about HarperCollins. And I think, okay, the, the Tower of ba Babel serves to mock the pretension of the contemporary imperial power of Mesopotamia. Penn, do you want to say something about that? No, I just like the notion it's another layer of the story. Yes. Good. Um, I, one of the professors at McCormick from, Center. From a context, from a, and it therefore parallels Eden. Because oh, Penn, I'm only catching every other word you're saying. Humans want to become like God. Humans want to become like God. Is that what it, you're saying? It parallels Eden when humans want. Right. And that is a very common interpretation. So um, that's good. I have the whole thing that I'm presenting to you today. I've learned from Professor Ted Hebert. He's a professor at McCormick Seminary, and he translated the book of Genesis for the Common English Bible. And he wrote the commentary notes about it in the Common English Bible. So um, he has gone back and I haven't gone and got all my notes to show this rabbi said this and that rabbi said that and more introducing to you like how the idea that we sometimes overlay a meaning into the text that maybe isn't the first meaning of the text and that it's possible for us to do different interpretations and come to different um, understandings of it. I um, is that Ted or Kathy raising their hand? Well, it's Ted. <laughs> Ted. Um, I guess I, I, I get the notion that uh, this is a um, enabler of diversity. On the other hand, I find it a heavy lift because mm -hmm. I think that um, well-meaning people have been trying to figure out ways to smooth our communication amongst each other. You may remember way back, there was, you know, talk of Esperanto as a world language and some of these things that were intended not for arrogance or power, but for understanding. So um, my, uh, my little background conversation with myself is, I think that's a stretch to, to make diversity the goal. I actually think a common language might help us speak to one another better. So I'd come out on the other side of that one. Well, uh, uh, yes, Ken. Yeah, I, I was thinking exactly what Ted was thinking, actually. And I mean, you know, we can posit that this the interpretation is that uh, God separated the people and, and spread them diversely all over the planet. But what we struggle with today, I think, is the integration of each other and the knowing of each other and the welcoming of each other and bringing us together so we know each other and, and see each other as, as equal humans. So it's an interesting thing that God would send us out and segregate us rather than keep us together. Yeah, okay, I see Colleen and then Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne, I'll keep it short. Um, but the best way to understand uh, someone who is different from you is to learn a couple of their words, is to enter into their language, not to have one language. So I disagree with what you're saying. Hmm. Go ahead, Suzanne. Uh, uh, could this be just a part of the ongoing argument back and forth? I mean, the Bible, the Old Testament is all like, Kings versus prophets, prophets versus kings. There's always this argument. And in Judaism, they say, if you have three Jew two Jews, you'll have three opinions. And in yeshivas, you're taught to question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there's never like a final doctrine, which is what I admire about Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, so here, you know, perhaps they're struggling, the writer is struggling with this whole idea 
of, hey, let's argue about stuff. That's the grown up way to be. And, uh, and, and it's part of this struggle about this issue, which is ongoing. It's not like, oh, God said this. It's like reflecting the writers of the Bible as people struggling with this, this very human issue. Thank you, Suzanne. Yes, I see uh, Craig. Yeah, this is a very pragmatic comment. A lot of the Bible tends to be uh, an explanation. It, it's, it's like a child talking to the mother, you know, why is the sky blue? Why, why does a fly buzz when he goes past? Uh, Mommy, why are there so many languages in, in different places? Well, and the, the ultimate answer after going around through th three levels of it is, well, God made it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the etiology, the source, what's the source of this thing that we now see happening? Um, that's, that's very true. And Suzanne, I love what you bring up about the rabbis. I love that in their commentaries, they'll say, this rabbi said that, that rabbi said this, this is the preferred interpretation. And this other rabbi said this fourth thing, like they do record the conversation and it's an acknowledgement that there's not one right way to see something. And um, none of us has the capacity to know the right thing, but we discern and we discuss, and this is the preferred interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I do affirm that for what we're doing here right now too. Um, I'm giving you another interpretation and I have some follow-up questions of, about how, we, how it affects how we think about things. But first I wanna call on Roger, cause I see you. Yeah, I, to me, the big, what I have just learned is that this has, to my mind, always been a punishment. And instead of being a punishment, it's really a gift that, that these people who were going to be so homogenous that they were all together suddenly finds that diversity is given to them. Yes. And I think that is one of the main points that I wanna make with this book. Like if we teach our children that our difference is a confusion and is a separation that's different from teaching them our diversity is interesting and we can connect with each other across all of our differences and our world is so much richer that's a different thing to teach our children and and i mentioned children because i'm gonna read you a story a children's book soon <laughs> uh, that does just this with this story because i think it's helpful to think about how the stories get inside our psyches and how that affects how we see our world. And I think it's possible to read about, to hear in this story that diversity is a gift to us. And that doesn't answer the question of, would it be good if we all had one language or would it be good if we could all communicate in the same language? Um, but I think it could say, even with different languages, we could find a way to not be so segregated. We could find a way to understand each other. Maybe just all being the same isn't, isn't working and maybe, I don't know. There's a lot to talk about it. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to ramble a little. Other thoughts about this? Yeah, Jeannie. You know, I was just thinking how many of us perhaps were raised with a sense of tribalism where anything different and other is not good uh, without even exploring it. Uh, so if you are not white, if you are anything but working or middle class, this is just how I, you know, if you're anything but Catholic, if you're anything but X, then it, then it was different and scary. And, and, and so I, I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> that moving forward, this, this new message of diversity is positive and good. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more, but it just took me back to the way I was raised and how anything other than what you looked like, who you hung out with was not okay. Yeah, it's Jeannie, it's making me think, and then I'll call on you, Marilyn, I see you. Um, it's making me think about what is the role of faith in helping us to reach beyond maybe some of our human weaknesses. And there, there is some kind of survival thing wired into us, I think, about being with the safe people who are like us, the safe tribe or whatever. But maybe part of what our faith does for us is help us get beyond that 
and help us use more of our brains and not just some survival brain that sees things as fearful when we could see those things with love and curiosity. And I say things, but I mean diversity, people, place, but I do mean places and things too, um, that we don't need to stay in a, in a small world. We can have a bigger world. I think faith has a role to play in that and maybe a story like this has a role to play in that. Marilyn, what were you thinking? Well, I don't want to be uh, off too much off the mark here, but one of the problems I've all had with the book of Genesis in general is that the writers are ascribing or transferring um, God as if, it, as if God had um, human thoughts, human emotions, um, anger and, um, you know, th that's, um, I think that they were not capable of thinking about God in, in an abstract fashion. And um, I'm not sure what the theologians have to say about this, but to ascribe human thoughts or emotions to God yeah. is, is beyond absurd to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, well, you raise a great question. What is the nature of God and how do we know who God is? And yes, many of the um, writers of the Bible in general, Old and New Testament, ascribe to God human characteristics. In the Old Testament, there are different ways of talking about God. And Genesis actually has one of the most interesting examples of that in the chapter one and two tellings of the creation, in which chapter one sees God in a certain way and chapter two sees God in a different way. Chapter one, God is this sort of majestic power that can speak a word, which that's humanized, right? That God speaks words. But in chapter two, God walks in a garden with Adam and Eve. That's a very different kind of God, earthy, earthy God who walks, literally walks around with the people. Um, so within the Bible, there's even some diversity of how people are thinking about God. My ideas about God do tend to be much more mystical in some ways, but I still pray to God like with a name as though God is a person. For me, I think that helps me connect to God because I think as a human being, I am maybe wired to connect to other human beings. So for the purpose of this spiritual practice or this sense of connection to God, um, I, I, in my mind, ascribe human qualities to God of qualities of love and care. Um, this is just how I think about it. How do other people think about it? This whole idea of giving God human characteristics. Is that something that speaks to you? Yeah, it speaks to me, and and I kind of see what Marilyn is saying about the Old Testament, because in the New Testament, of course, Christ comes in the form of a human being and, and brings that humanity to us so that we can understand God. God is man. And so uh, that was the, uh, I think in the New Testament, we got some of that and had it translated to us uh, in, in the words of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the beginning, he was the, the word. Well, Christ is the word. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Suzanne. If you consider that throughout history, there have been all these religions, each defining God differently and saying what that God's he, saying what this God thinks, and all this, I mean, it's like kind of ridiculous. If you look around you at how reality works, it's kind of all connected. And so it could be that God is that connectedness in the whole thing, the whole uh, Megillah. Um, all of it together as like the Native Americans, you know, they, they pray to our ancestors and our children to come and the, and everything on this in the sky and, uh, and on the earth and you know everything it's all connected and they connect with everything and that is like prayer in the presence of god as it's been called right so i hear you describing your conception of god as being mm -hmm. like a an all-pervasive essence of connection and for you that 
that kind of is a description of God or a way that you think about God. And then for other people, it's really important that God be able to talk to them and hear their prayers. And I'm just holding open the space for us to all have different understandings about God. But I think it's really interesting to talk about and hear from each other about our different. Um, there's, a, there's a, a button you can buy that says God is bigger than religion. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think if you ask God, so what are you? I think that's what God would say. Hey, I'm at least, you know, friggin' bigger than religion. Well, Presbyterians yeah. certainly believe that God is bigger than <laughs> any of us can fully understand. I, I, I like saw that. Craig, <laughs> um, Craig, Craig, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to go back to my little kid qu quizzing his mother. And the, the second level that we haven't quite gotten to or separated yet. Uh, Mommy, why does my friend Josh across the street go to church on Friday night instead of Sunday morning? Well, it's because he's Jewish, neutral. Um, but Mom, why is it Daddy doesn't like the family so much? And there's where we start getting the discrimination. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I hope that what this conversation um, is doing is just, you know, opening up the idea of interpretations and also starting to indicate like how our interpretations can then affect our actions. And Craig, that was kind of a good example of how our interpretations can start to affect our relationships with other people. Penn, I saw your note about this story being from the Yahweh traditions, which is very much the anthropomorphic God. I think that's the Genesis 2 God that walks with us in the garden, if I'm not mis mistaken. Um, yeah, that's what reminded me of it when you said that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, um, I think this class ends in five minutes, right? 1.30? So I'm going to go ahead and share this children's story with you. I'm going to show you the pictures and read it to you like your children. I invite you to tap into the child's part of yourself. But just think about how hearing this story told in this way um, makes you think about differences in our world. And this book is written by Professor Ted Hebert from McCormick Seminary who did that Genesis translation and all that study. So he's applying his interpretation to a children's story. And the co-author is Professor Lib Caldwell, Elizabeth Caldwell. And she is a retired professor from McCormick Seminary. Also, she taught children's education. So this Old Testament scholar theologian hooked up together with this children's educator. And they wrote this book to show this other way of thinking about, um, about this story. So I'm going to pull it up here. Can you all see that? God's big plan? Okay. Here we go. How did we get to be so different? Why do people speak so many different languages? Wouldn't it be easier if we were all alike? This is the story of the people of God found in the book of Genesis, people who were all alike and liked it that way. Then God surprised them. When the world started again after the flood, the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of Noah and Namah and all their descendants moved to a place called Shinar. Everyone in this very large family spoke the same language and lived together in the same place. Because they wanted this to be their home for a long time, they began to build a city. They made bricks out of mud and straw and baked them in furnaces until they were hard. They used hot tar for cement to hold the bricks together. They said to each other, let's build a very big city with very tall buildings. Shinar will be home for us. If we build a city with a very tall building, then we can stay together. This building will be so tall that its top will be in the clouds. It will scrape the sky. Our city and our skyscraper will keep us together forever. They liked living together in a city where everyone knew one another. They liked speaking the same language. They liked being all the same. God saw them building their city so they could all stay in one place. God listened to them all talking in the same language and God said, if I don't do something, everyone will be just like everyone else forever. God had a different idea, a plan for the world to be full of many kinds of people, 
First, God gave them different languages to speak. Then God sent them out to live throughout the whole earth. Because God gave them different languages to speak and different places to live, they didn't finish building their city. If they had, they could have called it many town because that is where the many languages of the world began. Instead, they called that city Babel because that was their word for dividing one language into many. Just as God created the earth with many different fish, birds, and animals, and just as God created many different things that grow and live on the earth, so God created people. We speak many different languages. We move in many different ways. We eat different kinds of bread. We eat in many different ways. We live nearly everywhere on earth. We come together to worship in many different places. The people who were building Babel had a little plan to stay together, but God had a bigger plan. God wanted to fill the world with different languages, different people, and different ways of living. And that's what God did. We have one minute for reactions. Like, how did it feel to hear a, that story? I see, I see signs of pleasure, smiling. Yeah, it was a wonderfully told story. And uh, I'm glad Ted Hebert got a hold of his wife uh, who uh, gave him the language of a child. Or anyway, it was just beautifully told. Yes. I think if, if we were teaching our children that, instead of teaching them that our diversity is a punishment for our pride in order to make it hard to get along, that's a different, very different message and faith begins to play a very different role in our lives. Well, I thank you all very much for being here today. And next week, we're gonna dig down into some of those hard uh, passages that have been used as weapons against especially black people and against women. And then in the third week, we'll get into some of the anti-gay passages and take a look at where, where we have overlaid some societal norms and values and um, how we can understand those texts in different ways that help the Bible play a positive, formative role in our lives. Thank you all very much.